He should be here any minute. At least that's what he tells me. Um, we're here with the episode 20 super special guest, uh, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Valiant, Matthew Klein. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, man. Absolutely. Thanks for joining. It's, it's always a big deal when we get to talk to somebody at Valiant. And I know, like, I'm super excited. I know, kid, is, he's been typing all caps to me all day. He's hyped for this. I know he's on his way. But just to kind of get things started, can you uh, tell us a little about your role at Valiant and how you got started with the company? Sure. So uh, I'm the vice president of sales and marketing. So basically, um, I oversee those two departments and try to synergize sort of the messaging um, and the voice of the company when it comes to the brand, when it comes to the books and the individual series, um, both from Valiant to uh, the industry at large, but also to the fans like yourselves um, and to ourselves because, you know, we're, we work there, but we're all pretty much fans too. So, um, and then on the sales side, um, I also work on long short-term strategy, just developing the uh, team and our relationships uh, with the comic shop owners um, and trying to figure out how and the the most effective ways are to message out to the retailers of hey check out valiant you know and and let them know what's coming out when um how to get their customers activated um keeping an eye on what's going on in the industry from that side so i'm i'm really lucky where i kind of get to be on multiple sides of the industry and get to interact with both the, the retailers the fans the press um, and kind of have my, my hands on a little bit of everything. Um, and that's, that's really where they are. Now, I, I started by accident, is how I like to tell people. So okay. I was working in a comic book store in Manhattan called uh, Forbidden Planet. Um, and I was there for a few years, and a very good friend of mine at the time um, was also working there. And Valiant approached him for a job interview and said, hey, do you want to be one of the sales reps? We're expanding our sales team. Um, and he was like, nah, I, I really want to focus on being a comic book writer. And you know, being, being a writer and, and being you know, full-time at Valiant, there might have been some conflict of interest for him. So he was like, I'm going to hold off. But there's a guy I work with that you should meet, and you should talk to him. And oh I, was, I was the referral. So. <laughs> Uh, this was, I want to say this was a September 2014, um, okay. and uh, I went through two or three, I think it was three or four actually rounds of interviews the first time, and uh, they, they hired me on, and uh, I started November 4th, 2014, uh, was my first official day with the company, so my anniversary is coming up. Ooh. And, um, uh, I was there full time in the sales department for over two years, and then mid December, 2016, I went back to retail, and I was working with Valiant part time. I was a consultant. I was still talking to shops and um, uh, doing that part time, multiple hours a week. And then in 2018, um, in like April of that year, I came back on full time as the head of the sales department. And then at the end of 2018, uh, they bumped me up and I took over the marketing department too. So I'll be six years next month um, without ever going a week uh, without value in my life somehow, some way. Oh, That's and my friend, exciting. my friend who, who recommended me for the job is Matthew Rosenberg. Um, no. Yep. I mean, now that's a story. Like, come on, that's really cool. Gets better. So Matthew Rosenberg, myself, and Vita Ayala all worked at Forbidden Planet together for years. No way. Mm -hmm. We were all in the trenches oh, together. That's incredible. Really, I mean, what are the chances? I keep telling them they need to do an alumni page because there's oh, – yeah. Like, not only that, but we've, we've had people from the Forbidden Planet family have gone on to, like, Nick Philpott, who wrote a story for Heavy Metal recently, Anna Peterson, who was at um, Fanagraphics for years in their sales and marketing departments there. Like we've we've had people all over the industry 
um, who started at Forbidden Planet. It's an amazing breeding ground for for talent on all sides of the publishing industry in comics. That, I think it just became a new bucket list place for me to go to. Like, I need to be in that place. Well, you just gotta call me when you go, because I'll take you down and I'll I'll find my old tag and I'll walk you around oh the door and I'll hand sell. Because that was that was my superpower. My superpower was hand selling. I didn't know anything else. I just knew how to sell books and how to talk to people. And apparently, and how you sales, that's what they need. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great skill to have in sales. <laughs> I'll tell you what, my where I'm most comfortable is probably on a convention floor at the booth, just hand selling those like uh, three for twenty deals at the booth, just those volume ones, um, <laughs> talking about the stories. I think that's probably my most natural element. Everything else I've had to learn. So, oh. and I guess that immediately makes me want to ask Vita Ela's now iconic live wire run. Heck yeah. Um, any chance of Rosenberg coming up maybe? Is that something you'd like to see? I, I, I'm i going to tell you, I'm going to give you some inside baseball right now. Some, okay. some stuff that I've never talked about before. Um, so uh, I would kill to have Matt Rosenberg on a book of ours. I'm mm -hmm. a big believer. It's not a matter of if, but when. Part of it is um, he's exclusive, I believe, still at Marvel. So it's it's a little trickier over there. Yeah, um, yeah. But I can say for certain that there might be a pitch or two for some very for some valiant characters from years past um, rolling around the servers. Um, oh. When and I'm talking like when he was doing like four kids, not four kids walking away. We could never go home when he was you know back then, and he was yeah. working, like doing the the Black Canary like fill in issues for DC. Oh. I think it was like during the Annie uh, Annie Annie Chu run. Excuse me. So. Yeah. Um, so I would love to get Rosenberg on there. Is there a character you think he'd be a good fit for? I mean, I want to see something a little bit more violent. I won't lie. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, his Punisher run is great. Right, that's immediately what I go to in that style and that aesthetic. I think he really nails that. And I, I see Punisher come up a lot when people talk about Rosenberg. Um, I'm a huge fan of Seeley on Bloodshot right now, but oh, so maybe good. it would be cool for a grounded Bloodshot. I mean, Seeley's like huge, big, big budget action flick style is he just. Was, like, he was doing like, like Die Hard meets Bloodshot, right? Like it's yeah. a, it's, and it's so much fun. It is just yeah. like um, I remember talking with him on a panel at C2E2 about it. Like my my favorite mo moment for the first issue of Bloodshot actually couldn't get in there, which I was really <laughs> bummed about. Um, sorry, I may have a guest uh, here, my cat Rogue, named after the X-Men character. Um, oh, she gets very jealous when I'm on the computer and not paying worship to her. So um, oh, that furry little tyrant might make an appearance if you're, if you're, if you're lucky. But, um, but no, it's just, it's just one of those things. I think that Tim, the, he had a song that Bloodshot was supposed to be singing in the in the truck at the first issue when he's like driving it into like the enemy and oh, yeah. uh, it was Santa Claus is coming to town, but we couldn't get the rights for it. Um, really? I was so mad. I loved that. Like that moment I was, I was reading the, the reading the script and I was just like, that's it. That's, that's bloodshot for me this run. I'm so down for it. Um, yes. Absolutely. You know, it was really good though, but I, I will always miss that moment. Uh, that's an inside moment like I love to hear because that, that really would have been something to, uh, at least memorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you what. I think still my one of my favorite moments from this run of Bloodshot is the first page of issue two that Brett Booth drew where he's like jumping at the giant fan that's going to just like the propeller that's going to yeah. absolutely tear him to shreds. And I was just yeah. like, that's a hell of a first page. Like oh, if, yeah. if you're not Definitely. interested in reading the second and third pages there, I can't help you. Like you shouldn't be reading this. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, I think for me, it's uh, when I think we were first introduced to Eidolon in four or five uh, and he's like melting, you know, in yep. that scene where she's kind of like holding him as he melts. Um, that was like very much when I was here for it. Like it, I can't I'm believe it. Really. I think, I think Brett might still own that page, actually. Really? That page might still be for sale. And I'm just saying, Christmas is coming up. Yeah, and I, mean, I think everyone deserves something great for just surviving 2020. So if you, 
<laughs> this is so true. I had no idea. I'm like, I'm like wanting to pause this to go check right now. <laughs> Maybe I can afford this. <laughs> I, I think it's, I think you still got it. I could be wrong. Um, maybe one of the listeners out there, if you guys picked it up, let us know. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So, I mean, we've talked about bloodshot. There's a lot going on with Valiant and I kind of wanted to dig in with you. Like you said, if you're running sales and marketing, especially during this time in the pandemic, what does it look like for your job to, to do sales when the publishing lineup has changed so dramatically? It has its challenges. Um, <laughs> a little bit. you know, when the industry shut down for two months, that's kind of rough. Um, yeah. no, so it's, it's one of those things. It's, um, you know, you, you almost feel like a wartime conciliary to quote the Godfather. So <laughs> it's a, it's, um, uh, if Heather Antos listens to this ever, she's going to roll her eyes real hard at that. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, but, um, no, so it's one of those things where it's it's an odd time, but it's a really exciting time. Mm-hmm. And here, yeah. here's why. It's odd because you've got to deal with constantly reevaluating what's happening in the marketplace, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to reevaluate um, how many books you should be doing. You need to reevaluate how many stores are open. Are they doing mail order? Are they doing curbside? Are they able to have people in there? How is that affecting their sales? Are are customers more looking for back issues and catching up on stuff? Are they buying more trade paperbacks? Are they still getting new comics the same way? Um, And now as you're getting into the holiday season, it's even weirder. And the reason is for most comic shops and most hobby shops, um, retail in general, but specifically these guys and bookstores, you make about 40% of your profit from Black Friday to Christmas. For those six weeks, you do about 40% of your year's net. Yeah. And this year is very different because you don't know exactly what people are going to be looking for. So it's, it's one of those things where because you have a distributor shutting down, because you have the shakeup with DC and Diamond, you have... Um, different guidances and for different geographic areas, there's no standard that you can go by. So, you know, a lot of comics are bought in New York and California and the Carolinas, um, Illinois, and they all have different guidelines for what type, what their business can look like. So it's a very hard, it, it's like nailing jello to a wall sometimes. <laughs> and you've got to completely reevaluate every week. All right, what are the shops saying? What are they seeing? You know, and that's where the relationships that we've built up with comic shops are so important right now more than ever because we've yeah. built up a trust where they know we're listening, right? Yeah. So our long-term for the long-term health of the company and the long-term health of the books and the series, we said, okay, we need to pull back a bit, right? We need to Mm -hmm. cut down the number of titles per month until we see where things are going. Right. And the thing about it is that, you know, I, I wish we had, you know, 20 books a month at this point. I wish that we could give all the number ones away at once, but you've got to give the book the best chance of success as you can find. Right. Yeah. And, and the books are so good. So it, it's one of those things where you don't want to jeopardize the characters. You don't want to jeopardize all the work that's gone into it. You want to give them the opportunity for good sell through, not just sell in. And so you've got to look at the market and you've got to look at what people are able to afford and what from a buying standpoint of the customer to the buying standpoint of the retailer. So it's, yeah. it's caused us to have to adjust, you know, things like Savage and Final Witness and Shadow Man, they're all on the docket to come back. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. And it becomes, uh, I think I said this uh, somewhere else, but it becomes that question of, you've got to look at the calendar too and see what the best time of year is. You know, you, you look at the sales history, you know there are certain months that are stronger than others. Um, and when you get into that December to February time, it's usually a tougher sell because of the holidays and the way that, that fluctuates cash flow. So generally you see a lot of big releases from companies 
a little bit February, but you can also do mostly like March, April is when people are flush again uh, to spend money on comics, uh, not customers, I'm talking retailers. So it's a, so you kind of usually save it. And that's why we did like Exo Man War relaunched in March of this year, 2017 it launched then, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You see like uh, books that launch in April, in May. May is a very big month because you tie it into free comic book day. So you have the largest single day of sales traffic to draft off of for that book. So you always put a big, big, big launch in May as well to kick off that season. So part of the part of the the algebra that we work with now is that as you're seeing cases ebb and flow and you're seeing new dynamics in terms of what federal funding and state funding there is and what support businesses are getting, what support individuals are getting so that they're gonna have expendable income, but you're also looking at the calendar now and you're going, all right, the, the best time to bring back these titles, you may have to wait a little bit longer for those number ones till you get to 2021. You're also gonna be closer to when there's a vaccine and when people will feel more comfortable and you get to that sweet spot. So yeah. it's that crazy balance and none of us, in any publishers thought we'd be in this position. Hey, how are you, Ken? Hey. Ken has joined. Hey, welcome. <laughs> right in the... We'll cut up. I didn't mean they're good. No, we're right no, in no, the... No, you're good, man. You're good. That's nice cool. posters like... back there too, by the way. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of what we're looking at. So that's that's sort of the thinking from from us. We, knew we wanted to make sure we finished off Doctor Tomorrow. We wanted to get that trade paperback out for um, the holiday time and something that's all ages. Um, we wanted to wrap up Quantum and Woody and get that in there in the fall as well for the trade paperback. And we also knew that we wanted to keep Bloodshot and Rye because we wanted to. We were you know one of the things we were hearing is like we need. Um, more mainstream characters that have a hardcore following to kind of help get them through this. So we said, all right, we'll keep Bloodshot, we'll keep Rye going, we'll plan to bring back XO um, for the fall of this year, you know, and have those, you know, larger tentpole characters that are more widely associated with Valiant to start with to get them through this time period. And then you'll see Savage, and then you're going to see um, wrapping up Visitor, and you're going to see, you know, Shadow Man, the new series, come in. We've got announcements planned through the end of the year of when those books are coming back. We just announced, you know, Harbinger for summer of next year. I'm sorry, the Harbinger for summer of next year. We announced Ninjax going to be coming in 2021 as well. Um, so we also, you know, we've got a lot of irons in the fire, and you know, it, we're, we're making the best of it that we possibly can. But again, we're playing chess, not checkers. And we're looking at long term, not how to get through six months. We're still looking at what's the next five years. And that's the important distinction. Sorry, I rambled. Um, Amazing. That's, in, that's really, I think that's what it takes right now. It's such yeah. unprecedented territory. It is. And why it's super interesting to talk with people like yourself that are in behind the scenes, but still still interact with shops and even customers to try to feel what the industry is going through and what's needed to navigate it right now. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. And you know, it's it's one of the reasons I love talking to to you guys and to the fans in general because I mean, on on the outsides from where you guys are, it's it's one perspective, and then. Yeah. on you know the insides where i'm at it's a whole different perspective and it's important to find a way to you know communicate with each other right and make sure you guys know where our head's at and you guys know that we're we're looking at this long term and you know we're fine we're doing great we're just taking our time to get back there um and then you guys also know it's like hey well what happened to all these books it's like i they're here they're ready to go uh, <laughs> literally we could hit the print button on most of them now and have them ready for you because we were working so far ahead. Editorial was working further ahead than they ever had um, as a company. Like I've had pages for the Harbinger for seven months now. Um, what you guys saw in that article, they've been there for so long. Um, you know, Shadow Man, we have two issues completely drawn and done at this point. So it's it's one of the things like. The books are in great shape. The books are ready to go. It's just that 
we got to make sure that when we bring them to market, they have the best chance of success from a sales perspective as they possibly can. And that's the waiting game right now. And that's the, that's the, the seed that we're navigating. So that, that actually brings me to a pretty interesting uh, topic I wanted to bring up with the harbinger. Yes. Um, By the way, know, I want you to know, I feel so underdressed looking at you right now. Like I need to go put on like a shirt and tie. Um, just like I, I feel, I feel so. I, I'm sorry. I just need to apologize. Oh, I, I need to comb my hair. I'm or wearing something. Marilyn Monroe, wearing Legion of Doom spike in, in Road Warriors. Like, so you've got, you know, this just looks so like professional and put together. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'll like really like ask me anything. But okay, so. Um, with with the Harbinger, right, mm -hmm. and planning ahead. Sorry. Now, with the new Harbinger, how much are are we looking at like a, uh, let's say like a like an Iron Man MCU situation? Will the movie be more based on like the two? Well, uh, how do I pr frame this without trying to trick you? What's what's first, the chicken or the the movie or the comic? Is that sort of thing? Yeah, like influenced by how it will be? Well, I know I know the comic is first, but yeah. going forward, is it going to be? You think there's a possibility that like the movie will have like influence to change the direction of the book, kind of no. like what you've seen with like say like Guardians of the Galaxy and Iron Man with like the MCU, or do you think you'll stick to your guns as far as that goes going forward? The only the only influence that it will have on the book is the influence that we want it to. So mm -hmm. we will, and it's the same with Bloodshot. Like you've noticed, like for one last shot, we're bringing in KT and Wiggins. You know why? We love those characters, so we want to bring them into the books. There was no mandate from, from Sony. There's no mandate from DMG. That DMG is so lovely with us. They're very hands off. They let us do anything that we want to do with the books. They really do. Um, you know, like I, I was fully prepared to have more concessions, quite frankly, because we asked them, like, is, is there anything we can do to help you out? Like, what, what do you need? We're a team. And they're just like, you keep doing what you do. You know what you're doing. You're the publisher. You know what stories work. You know what the fans are looking for. You know what the market's doing. Go do your thing. So like we, if, if there's something cool from the movie that we want to incorporate, we will. If it's a hairstyle or a costume or a character or a wrinkle to an origin story, I say this without having read any scripts, by the way, um, like it's then, then we will. If, if there isn't, then we won't. I mean, what Jackson and Colin and Robbie are building um, is from them. It's from them, uh, and Heather Antos is, is steering that ship beautifully. Um, and it's it's a super exciting direction for Peter. It's a Peter Stanchek book, first and foremost, which is really cool. You're going to start with Peter. It's going to build around him. Um, you know, it's, it's a book that feels very true to the core of what Harbinger is. And we're really excited. So, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, like there is nothing from this series that's coming from any influence anywhere other than pure love of these characters. That is it. And I think that's super exciting. Yeah. I, I really bloodshot when it dropped and we got a chance to see it both ken and i in theaters before everything happened and theaters started shutting down we were like right there in like some of the first days and actually catching it in theaters sure and it was it was exciting but also it was exciting to see what Celia and booth and everybody was doing with the series and how it was very much its own thing yes and i'm i'm really appreciative of that for what valiant's doing and it seems like they're they're very consistent in in that quality and that execution and direction really. I mean, all the all the creators, and editorial, you know, this is this is their baby. This is what they do. Yeah. And they, you know, we make sure that they have you know free reign to tell the story that they want to tell. We're a very editorial driven company, which is not always the case um, with a lot of publishers out there. So it's it's a really it's it's a bit of an exception and it's. A, Quite frankly, it's a real joy uh, to work with that. Um, so it's it's really cool. But you know, I, I totally agree with you. Like what what they're doing in Rye right now. You know, Dan Abnett, Juan Jose Rip. Like that is their own story. There's no direction coming from anywhere. It's like they're they've got free reign. You know, to to really play Tim and Brett and Jason and and now Pedro on Bloodshot. Like this is just yeah. some epic 12 issue craziness that you guys are seeing at this point. And then 
Uh, I mean, the direction for Shadow Man, for the Harbinger, for Ninjak, like they really get to stand on their own and be their own books and explore their own genre and, um, and explore new wrinkles to the characters that you haven't necessarily seen before. Um, but to do it in a way that builds off of what came before, right? And that's really cool. We don't, we're not interested in retelling the same story over and over and over again. We don't want to give you the same thing that you always expected from this book is that's boring. You lose readers that way too. So it's, it's one of those things where you've got to keep evolving and you've got new stories to tell and fresh ideas. As long as it's true to who those characters are, you can go anywhere. Savage is one of my favorite examples of that. Um, uh, what's what Max Bemis and Nate Stockman are doing on there is they literally pick up, from the moment that the previous series ended, which was he's in London, right? The very end of Savage, he's in London and you're just like, what's going on? And so the question is not about him getting back to the island or anything like that. Like, why would you take him out? Start there. What what happens next? What's the, you know, we, we kind of, we, we explore like, what is this kid who's been hunting dinosaurs um, <laughs> what's he going to be like in 2020 London? Like, that's the, the crazy thing. So, so you stay true to that, what's come before and you, you keep the continuity and you keep the through line of the character, but you're given a fresh new setting to tell a new type of story with them and evolve them and, and progress. And that's really cool. Awesome. So, like just going forward with um particularly say like with harbinger right um yeah. we've noticed this is something we have talked quite a bit about that it seems like each character is almost like a um front runner of genre you know with like um dr tomorrow you know you have your, your more upbeat like you, you said yourself um you know more family oriented for everybody um and he kind of feels feels mm -hmm. like the like the superman role almost and like the whole from this angle and then you know you have like ninjack which is like you know uh like lisa said was more like spies and has like that that cool like oh, jazz this, 70s this, this new series really it. does um, it's so cool i'm so excited for it tight so so what would you say like would be the direction for peter because you're because you're dealing with a character that's like pretty op right like 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 we all know that peter is one of the top yeah. dogs peter but... on some level like peter is revolution peter is underground peter is um he is i i mean the story is about as gritty and personal an exploration as i think we've ever seen from this publisher. Um, and I think that you're gonna see something truly extraordinary with this book and with where they're going. And you have an artist that is gonna bring such energy and vibrancy um, that it's literally gonna, the, the comic's gonna vibrate in your hands. It's gonna be so alive. And I think that, but I think that truly Harbinger has always been about revolution. Harbinger has been about generational conflict. Harbinger is about, you know, someone above you saying, this is who you're supposed to be, and them going, no, I'm not, to heck with you, right? And and being wrong sometimes, right? Like, that's the cool thing. It's just like, you're not necessarily right when you do it or how you do it, and that's the cool gray area that you get to explore. And with Peter, he's in a place where he has to discover literally who he is. And then he has to discover who the world sees him as. And then he has to discover who um, the people closest to him see him as. And then he's got to figure out who he wants to become and how does he get there. And that is a hell of a journey to put a character through. Because um, again, like you're, you're after Harbinger Wars too. So you are, you are in, you are in the post Peter as possibly mass murderer um, kind of deal going on. So, and, and that's all there. That's all there from, from day one, you know, Jackson and Colin were so excited to get to play with Peter at this moment in this way. Um, the motto for the book 
that we've been saying around the office is be better. That's been our tagline. That's been our mantra with the Harbinger. Be better. And what that means, you guys are going to get to find out. Oh, that's so exciting. Because really, as soon as the announcement happened, and it was right off the bat that Valiant was like, we're not ignoring this character's past mm -hmm. by any means. And oh. it's so controversial, really. You dig into who Peter Stanchek is and the kind of the history. There's a lot there that is pretty quickly controversial. I mean, it's not that difficult to get There's to. There's so much. And and it's one of those things where I, I will say that I think that at times um, previous iterations of, of the company would go right up to the line of controversy, but then kind of back away from it and, and kind of avert from it. They pivot. You don't get that this time. We are going into the thick of, we, we don't mind if we're controversial. What we do mind is if we're not being true to the character and we, if we're curbing the story. And what we want is Peter is in a place and Peter is in a time because we are in a time where there is so much to explore about who you are, who the world thinks you are, who the world tells you you should become versus who you are destined to actually be and how do you get there. And you've tried different paths before. What path do you try now? What has all those done for you? And so you, the weight of everything that Peter has done before, of everything that has happened from the Dysart run to Rafer Roberts to Matt Kent, you will feel it. You will feel the weight, but you're not beholden. This is not like Harbinger Wars issue six or anything, right? Like this is the Harbinger issue one. And what's cool is that because of where Peter starts, anybody, any of your friends who've never read a Valiant comic, any of your friends who have never read a comic book ever, period, this could be your first comic and you will jump right in and feel at home. And that is the goal of every number one that we have coming out from Savage to Shadow Man to Ninjak to the Harbinger to XO. Um, the goal was, the mandate was, this is not just someone's first Valiant comic book. This is someone's first comic book ever, period. Does it have that level of accessibility while still continuing to honor the legacy of the characters? That's the tightrope that we're walking. That's the mandate. And I think you'll see a great success with that as well. So, you know, as, as you're talking about it, this is kind of just running through the back of my mind where you're talking about a, you know, like a journey of self-discovery from a character that we've, we, I feel like a lot of us are going to go into it with a lot of preconceived notions because mm -hmm. it's, you know, like you mentioned all the different runs from Dice Hard on. Um, but it's almost like, and I don't know if this was intentional, but it's almost like the, like the other side of the coin with like life and death of Toyo Harada, where it's more like the death of... Maybe not so much, you know, erasing, like you said, but Peter going forward as the harbinger, like this is a whole new chapter mm -hmm. in his life. So was that something that was intentional or is that just kind of like, just how it kind of panned if out? It's a, if, nice. if you like it and it's a good idea, it was absolutely intentional. I promise. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it is. <laughs> no, so but, but no, because there were, I, I know that there were discussions in, in editorial and with our publisher of, you know, Life and Death of Toyo Harada was the culmination, right, of, of that character and of, of Josh's run with that character. And with the Harbinger, this is not necessarily, this isn't a culmination. This is a new beginning, right? This is, this is a starting point. And so it's very much treated in that way. And you are in a post-Harada Valiant universe with Peter now, um, on his own where he starts um, in that first issue. And so you have so many possibilities of what, what is it now when Peter is truly probably the most powerful man on the planet. Um, there's nobody that, you know, is there anybody that can check him into place? They're going to try and you're going to find out who that person may be um, as, as you read through the first arc. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really going to be something it's, there's, there's an excitement and an energy for this character, um, and for the type of story that's being told that 
I don't think you're going to quite have seen before from Valiant. And that's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. Because we couldn't have gotten here without everything that came before it. And that's the key. Wow. And I, I have to use that to lead into something I wanted to dig into that is a bigger picture of Valiant. Dig it, man. We could dig talk it. Like all day. There's so many great books coming. Mm -hmm. But how you mentioned that there's a consideration that this could be somebody's first comic book. Yes. And I feel like this comes from a, a, a broader, uh, I guess, perspective of thinking for mm -hmm. what Valiant is. You've got Valiant in the movie theaters now, Starry Vin Diesel. You've got another one in the works. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of new announcements for partnerships. So you've got Mighty Mojo Toys, uh, H3 Sports Gear, Displayed, mm -hmm. uh, Bluefish Studios. That's got the game coming out. Night Dive is doing the remaster of Shadow yeah. Man. Shadow Man, um, uh, that's there's Do you a guys lot. like action figures? Oh, absolutely. Dude. The more, the better. Really? Absolutely. The, the Bloodshot action figure was, like, I pre-ordered that one. <laughs> that one was very cool. Don't get me wrong. I was, I was really excited when I got to hold the prototype in New York Comic Con. Um, oh. because we, we displayed it on the booth. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> there he is. I think that might have been like my first look at, at Bloodshot in the movie because I got to see those pictures of the toy first. It was it was most people's first look. Was it? Um, yeah, because I don't think I don't think any I don't think any uh, footage of him being like all white had popped yet because it's not in the first trailer. So yeah. it was, I'm pretty sure it was the first time people really got to see him like that, which is so yeah. cool. Yeah. But, no, we we've, we've got so many announcements, and we've got more yeah. to come, which is really cool. The only thing that that you know, the world as it has been has done is it's just delayed things. Um, that's that's really about it. So we've just had to be patient now, which yeah. sucks. Um, I'm a very I want it now and I want it all kind of guy. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. So so for me, I'm just like constantly like, can we talk about this yet? No. Can we talk about this yet? No. Can we talk about the harbinger yet? No. Uh, uh, Again, I've had that artwork for seven months, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so hard to sit on something like that for so long. I saw the outline for this thing at the end yeah. of 2019. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, I have year one. The outline of that thing is dated like November 2019. The year one of the Harbinger. I've got it on my computer still. So it's like it's it's all there. It's all crazy. So that's the hard part. That's why Greg never lets me come on these interviews is because I keep forgetting what we have talked about, what we can't talk about yet. So <laughs> That's pretty great. I mean, there's just a lot going on. And you, when you see Valiant as a publisher and as a force and almost in fandom, you're seeing kind of, I guess, that reach get it's, it's expanding at least. Well, you're seeing cool. it. You know, it's yeah. like what we all know. What's so great about it is that you know, it's, we want to be a welcoming environment too. We want to be a welcoming fandom. We want to be a universe that says, come check us out, be a part of it, you know, and wherever you feel comfortable, you can jump in. Um, the blessing and the curse is that you have, to your point, Ken, you have a, a spy book like Ninjak, right? So if you're, if you're a born identity or a James Bond or a Batman fan or whatever, we can pull you over and you can enter the Valiant universe that way. If you want epic sci-fi and you come more from a Thor or Iron Man, um, Conan, you know, Burroughs, here's Exo Man of War, you know, get in there. If you're coming from, um, you know, if you're coming from a different sort of fandom, we can bring you in through Britannia. We can bring you in through the Harbinger. We can bring you in through Savage. We can bring you in through, um, Divinity, we can bring you in through Rye. There's literally a thousand different entrances into the Valiant universe. And that's a cool thing, but it also is a little tricky because you then give the line that every shared universe ever says, which is, oh, you can jump in anywhere, but you actually can. Um, so, but people are so used to it being inaccessible and they hear the idea of shared universe and they go, I don't need that in my life. That's too much. You're going to make me buy 30 books, 29 of which I don't care about. And I don't want to read. And you're going to make me pay for all these things. And we're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, four issues, four issues. And there are some optional tie-ins. Look at Book of Death. Look at The Valiant. Look at Divinity 3, right? Yeah. Um, 
And so, so you gotta like ease them into it on some level. You you gotta t you gotta convince them you're telling the truth when you say no. You can jump in anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Like oh, I love horror and I love I love um, to use the Tim Seeley book. You, I'm a huge revival fan, right? Like I love that series to death. Him, Mike Norton, what they did on that, love it. If you're a revival fan, you need to pick up Shadow Man, right? Because that's your that's your jam. You could pick up Doctor Mirage too. But you can bring the same fan into the Valiant universe if you're an image reader or Marvel reader or DC reader or Dark Horse reader um, or Dynamite. If you're an Archie reader, pick up Doctor Tomorrow. You know, it's one of those things where you now have truly so many different entry points that there is a Valiant book for any and everybody. And that's really cool. And that's a really interesting place to be in as a shared universe. Yeah. Absolutely. And kind of what it brings. I know it impacts your role uh, in, in the sales and marketing side. I, I've, I've, I've actually thought about you. We run the press articles, you know, announcing mm -hmm. these partnerships and stuff like that. I'm like, how difficult is it to manage the, I guess, both the excitement and the, the load of content that you got in all of that awesome publishing lineup, plus games, you know, plus posters, plus gear coming out, puzzles, action figures. Does all of that kind of go into your role at Valiant on a day-to-day -day basis and how you're trying to help push the company? I mean, in some way, form or fashion, sure. I mean, you know, those those partnerships are handled mostly through our licensing department, right? They, they handle the business side of it. My job really comes into play when it's time to message it and to let you guys know, hey, we're doing this thing. Here's where you can get it. Um, you know, to, to really what we call the B to C, which is the business to, to consumer. Um, it's from Valiant to the fans who, who are excited about this and are going to want to purchase it. Right. Yeah. So that's really where my role starts to come into play and Greg's role where we, we develop the messaging, we develop the press releases, we make sure that we have the photos that we need. We talk to the outlets to get the articles covering it. We make sure um, that the press release goes to the people who are going to do it most. We search out the influencers. Um, we look for promotional opportunities. So once the once the ink is dried and once the product is built, like those puzzles, I have a funny story about those puzzles. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Don't let me forget. But um, you know, once that comes into play, then that's really where it is, uh, where where I come into it. So I might know about it. A month in advance, I might know about it six months in advance, a year in advance, depending on the type of partnership and the product that's being um, uh, worked on at the time. So, so that's really where it comes in for me on that day-to-day -day basis. And then it's not just making the announcement, but we also want to make sure that we are reminding people, you know, a week later, three days later, four days later on social media, digital marketing. Hey, in case you missed the announcement, you can get these really cool Mighty Mojo puzzles. Hey, just in case you missed it, you know, fall's coming, get yourself a faith hoodie through Pop Cult USA, right? So it's it's that sort of deal. So it's also that reminding, you know, hit that tippy, the tipping point of messaging, as they say, um, so that it sticks in your brain um, is always the goal. Okay, so I mean, I guess it's a great time for the puzzle story. <laughs> so, Here's what happened with the puzzles. Okay. Um, so uh, we were talking to Mighty Mojo, and we were like, "Hey, do you have any photos of the puzzles themselves? Like all, re like all the pieces out, and they're all made." And they were like, "Oh, we don't yet, actually." So I was like, "Okay, could you send me one, and and like, and I can like take photos and see what it looks like." And so they sent me uh, one of each puzzle. And my infinitely better half, who is much more visually oriented, I am not. I'm a writer by trade. Um, like, I'm not an artist. I can't. I have a horrible spatial relationship. I'm very clumsy. Um, so we spent three nights and days putting together that bloodshot puzzle um, that you'll see on my social media, my personal social media, and also that our production team took and put into the actual, like, graphic in the press release um, that is the puzzle that myself and Lauren, my, my infinitely better half that she made, um, and put together. And we were just like cursing that thing. Like we were up till like 1am one night cause like we need to get the press release done like the next day or whatever. We were still putting it together. 
Uh, it was just, it was insane. So now I owe her another puzzle um, <laughs> where I promise that we, we're not on a time frame to complete it. So that's, that's one of my Christmas gifts to her. Uh, so I have to go find like a thousand piece puzzle. Oh, God. A, a timed puzzle. I don't know if that sounds really fun. <laughs> I, I found out that she truly does love me, guys. That's that's one of the things that she reaffirmed. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, keep but real quick, because you're naming off titles there when you're talking about the shared universe. Yeah. And I caught something. I want to see, make sure we're on the same page, and, and maybe. So. Every even Doctor Mirage just ended a series, mm -hmm. but two names that you mentioned haven't had one in a while. Yeah, Britannia and Infinity. Infinity. Right. Yeah, um, is that maybe a Freudian slip? But there might be something on the horizon. I'm more of a Jungian myself, so I don't know that that I've got any Freud in me. But um, <laughs> uh, listen, would you guys like to see another Britannia or another Divinity? Yeah. Yes. I Absolutely. Was it in Rye that we got like that little nod to Britannia with the Roman soldiers? Um, you did, didn't you? you yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like little little nods like that. It's like as a fan, you're like, that's really cool. I'd love to see Britannia. <laughs> Let me just say, guys, the Valley Universe is a very large place, mm. and those are characters that certainly have a place in it. So if you see them come back around again. I think you absolutely should not be surprised. And I think that for one of those characters, a book that has already been mentioned, um, that was already solicited, in fact, you might want to really pick it up and just pay attention. Just pay attention. I'm not going to give it away. Um, the artwork does it for me already that you guys have seen publicly. But um, but take a look out there. You know, you'll you'll you might see you might see the beginnings of something uh, for either Britannia or Divinity in particular. So I will leave okay. that. Yeah, go. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> one one other question about future stuff. I saw the one. Are... Ask me twenty. Oh oh okay. But this this one this one I I tried to get uh I tried I tried to get Alejandro on this one, but he he was like mm -mm, I'm not biting. So. There in the teasers, there is a blue spherical image, and I think the the t the tagline is "Reality is not absolute." Now, the universe is not absolute. And, there you go. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I was very proud of that tagline. Uh, <laughs> but that was also "Time is not absolute." Was the tagline to the original Unity Saga? I don't know. What so, you're talking about. Oh, oh. <laughs> No clue what's going on there. None. I have no idea what you're referring to. <laughs> I've never Kids heard of this. Of this in a in a three, five, come back. <laughs> I, I think you guys are absolutely overthinking this and just looking for uh, things that don't exist. And you know, it's. Uh, I think I think you really should just take a chill and just not in any way, shape, or form. Uh, go with with that instinct. I, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, we'll abandon that pretty quick and on to something new here. <laughs> um, um, so let's talk about, out of all these awesome announcements that we've talked about so far, mm -hmm. which one are you personally most excited for as a fan of Valiant? You're going to make me choose between my children? What's wrong with you? Is there is there a favorite that you don't like to say out loud? Maybe generally my favorites are the most recent ones because that's the one that I've been like in my head about. Um, sorry, we're about to get a guest. Um, there she is. Oh, Rogue. So, this is my cat Rogue. She's 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 uh, my security here. So if I say the wrong thing, I'm in trouble with her. But um. I mean, look, right now I'm riding high off it, so I'm I'm super, super, super excited for the Harbinger. Again, I think that this is a perfect blend for um, people like yourselves who know the Valiant Universe in and out and are big fans, but also for brand new um, uh, citizens of the Valiant Universe, if you will. And so I'm very excited. Um, I'm a big fan of this creative team. I know that Jackson and Kelly are longtime fans of this character, of this universe, and that this is a very personally important story 
to everyone involved and you're going to see a lot of love and you're seeing a lot of passion in there. And that is infectious. When you see, you know, creators do that, it's infectious. Um, I'm actually going to pivot and I'm going to give you guys something I don't think you're expecting me to say. I am incredibly excited for you guys to read issue two of Exo Man of War next month. Um, what is happening from Dennis Hopeless Hallam and Emilio Leso with Eric is absolutely thrilling. Um, I remember reading the first two scripts when they came in back before the world became what it is now. And I remember thinking to myself, I have never cared more about this character than I do reading these issues. And his journey, he's, he's presented, he's a king, he's a warrior, he is a man out of time, he is honorable, he is noble, um, but he is also absolutely certain in what is right and what is wrong. And he is absolutely certain in he knows what is best. And he is absolutely certain about his code and his ethics and what he believes in. And he is born from war, from trauma, um, from the loss of his arm, from watching his people be enslaved on his watch, from taking three years to free them, from the wars that he fought off planet. This is a man forged from his battles. And what they are doing with this character and how he is finding a sense of community in today's world in what it is for today to be a hero um, is something very exciting and really, I'm gonna use a word, it's beautiful to watch this character grow and be tested. And I love the relationship between him and Shanhara um, that you see developing more and more and more. It is the most central relationship maybe in the mythos of the character and it has never been explored in this fashion before as true partners. Um, and that's a really cool thing that Dennis is bringing to the table that I am so excited for you guys to see issue two and how that's continuing to evolve through the rest of the arc uh, and beyond as well. Hey, well, I'm hyped, I'm ready for it. That's, I know we were really, we really love, <clears throat> excuse me, the first you issue. You ain't nothing yet. And as good as that first issue is, oh, the second issue is going to knock your socks off. Well, I, I think that's good, especially considering like the pacing of that first issue. Keeping it going up like that, I think, is definitely the right choice. Um, you're, you're on a roller coaster. That first issue mm -hmm. starts with a bang, right? He's got the spaceship. He's trying to keep it from the, the vine ship, and he's trying to keep it from destroying uh, basically parts of New York. And then that the end, the cliffhanger on issue one. He's literally got a giant robot with a gun to his head saying it's over you know like it's it's just like how's he get out of it does he get out of it does shanhara get out does she not get out who knows so it's it's to pick back up from there and then where issue two ends um you are seeing eric at a point that i don't know you've ever seen this character before at the end of issue two and how that sets up what's to come in the next issue um, is really, really exciting. And I'm, I'm very excited for you guys to experience it. Um, and we'll see what you think. You'll have to have me back on and tell me if you liked it or not. That's all. So. Absolutely. Whenever, hey, whenever you want to come on, just let us know. I'll come on every week, man. <laughs> I'll just be, you know, I'll just, I'll be like your virtual server, just getting you like cocktails and stuff. It's fine. Um, I think it's co-host status at that point. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. No. Thank you, really. Thank you so much for joining us. And it's always going to be fun to pick your brain about Valiant. And totally. Just what to get excited about. Um, here's what I'm going to say to you guys, too. Um, so we just had the announcements for Ninjak a little while ago. We had the announcements for The Harbinger. Um, I want you guys and I want your listeners and the fans to keep your eye out for two places. Um, one is Newsarama um in november and the towards the end of this month in time for halloween um keep your eyes out on youtube because there's going to be uh, some very cool announcements um coming out then as well 
and I'm just talking about publishing. I'm not even talking about all the other stuff we got going on. You, you know, the, the other things I teased in there that we talked about, um, those are coming at a different pace, but just purely on the books, um, you're going to see more coming from us October, November uh, on those two places. So keep your eyes peeled. I'll hear you here first. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I can think of a better better note to close out on. That's pretty <laughs> – I'm going to go around my turn my house a little bit on that one. I'm, I'm always excited to hear about your news. And you pretty much just loaded us up with great stuff today, man. It's amazing. Um, you know, just like Nick said, uh, thank you for, you know, just taking time to come talk to us. Uh, we appreciate it. We know the listeners will appreciate it. Um, it's truly been a pleasure. Um, and, well, I guess we'll do it again next week. Yeah. But, uh, I'm, I'm totally cool. That's fine. My Wednesday nights are usually pretty clear at this point. So, like, yeah. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> no, but I, I want to say thank you to you guys just for having me on. You guys have an amazing show. You've got, you know, Comic Watch is an awesome site. Um, we're always, we're always really, you know, proud and, and honored to to get to, to break some news with you guys, offer some exclusives and see what we can do. Yeah. But, you know, one of the cool things is that you – we are in a very privileged position um, where we have such amazing fans for these characters and this universe. And it's something that we don't take lightly. And it's something that we feel the weight to honor that, um, to honor your trust and to honor your enthusiasm, and your love for these characters. Um, and it's, it's something that we, we really, we really appreciate on so many levels and, I think now more than ever, it's it's important to have that community and to have that uh, sense of togetherness in there. And it's it's a real privilege to be on this show with you guys and to get to talk to talk to the fans directly. And truly, anytime, just give me a ring. Well, thanks again, Matt. Um, we'll have to set that up. But for all our, everybody at home watching, remember, keep buying comics, uh, support your local yes. comic book shops, and stay there.